All right, here we go again. Thank you. As soon as somebody interrupted me, I knew, uh oh. All right, so, oh my gosh, I've gotten, I said quite a bit. So, all right, I've got to do it again though for the students that aren't here. Um, so, we have this whole list of virtues, and now you're sort of wondering well, wait a second, we did the goddesses. And then we did the virtues related to the goddesses. And we did bring up the double standard, right? So concerning sex, for example, you know, men get to get away with a lot of stuff that women don't, or drinking, uh, or eating, you know, what your weight is, all that sort of stuff. So we talked about the double standard. Then we did the gods. And then we think, oh my gosh, here women's archetypal, the patterns in patriarchy, they have, they seem to have very different life trajectory than men. But Boland says a woman can activate Apollo in her psyche. She can activate Hermes. And it's even a good thing. I mean, the best human life would sort of be able to, to maneuver all of them. Um, but she would do it like she would be basically an Athena, but she needs to activate Hermes in order to be a good public speaker, right? To be persuasive. Um, so in general, this is true. There are more women who seem to be following the Apollonian archetype, women scientists. And so, you know, you see these images of women scientists. A book came out recently, the woman who invented CRISPR and got a Nobel Prize for it. But the stories that I've heard when women scientists have written biographies, autobiographies, is that their, the context of their life, like their life trajectory is very different from just their life as a scientist, right? And so I, that's definitely true of me. Um, I can go to a philosophy conference, but I know that my life story is just entirely different than these white guys. Um, and it's different, you know, it's different. I mean, skin color makes a difference. Privilege, a lot of people in philosophy went to the fancy prep schools and, you know, they're privileged and I didn't have that. So there's all these ways that people divide and are not able to flourish. So class is a terrible problem, but we're focusing on gender. Um, so, so then we have, okay, the male and female. Now we have, when we're talking about the men's life trajectory, she talks as if, you know, this one tends to have multiple sex partners. I mean, most of them do in a sort of neutral way, but she does say that the therapist tries to get the out of control gods to bring in Apollo, get a strategy, bring in Zeus, start to get enough. Some of the gods don't want to have anything to do with a job or providing for themselves. So they do have to do that. They have to develop some kind of a position in a hierarchy. Um, they have to make a life plan. Uh, the Hades needs to activate Hermes. Um, but anyway, so, so let's see. Oh yeah. So ultimately the therapist will say that having those affairs broke people, right? So families would break apart and it's not good, right? It cripples, it, it wounds the wife if you have one, it cripples the women because it cripples them and their life story. The children that are born are crippled. 
And so she's not advocating this. I think what happens is that these guys don't self-correct, right? They don't follow the virtues and they go to an extreme, the one that they tend to. So they live closer to their archetype. They haven't learned how to balance these things and avoid falling back into this much more primitive comfort zone. And so, and so they have a midlife crisis and that's when they come to the therapist is something went wrong. <laughs> and so, so it's better not to allow this stuff to go wrong in the first place. So that's why at Delphi, it says nothing in excess, right? Know thyself, know your fantasies and your phobias, know your weaknesses and your strengths, and don't get obsessive and don't fall back into that, you know, um, inflated sense of your own worth without paying attention to other people and their needs and their desires and you know their goals, how they can flourish. So we're born with the potential to develop this. Each virtue is, is, uh, is related to a natural capacity that's just a product of evolution really and the evolution of our brains. Remember with Apollo, all, we switched from a cyclical culture to a much more complex one. And so all these virtues are um, in the light of the complexity. So I was just reading um, about a woman, I think her name's Rachel, she's young, and she was a, a computer wizard, right? Good for her. But she is, she's writing about how to avoid hacks. And so she is a really, really good hacker. But among the hackers, there are the white hats and the dark hats. And again, I mean, we shouldn't, it's that white and dark, you know, we should just say the good hats and the bad hats. We shouldn't associate them with color, I think. Um, so, so you can take that skill. So now we have these Apollonian women and the, like up Apollonian men, they can choose to use their skill to help people flourish or to gain power and wealth, right? And the hackers, the bad ones are really bad. Um, so now basically we fight cyber wars, the cyber wars, are a bigger deal than the boots on the ground wars. And so in a way, the way evil works is much more subtle. You know, it isn't just <laughs> swords and shields, right? You don't have to go out there with your armor on, but it's the same kind of drives. It's the same kind of extremes. It's the same kind of corruption, has the same negative effects on other people. It's just a different cultural context. And, and also at this point in history, anybody from any country in the world could be involved in making choices about given their genius at knowing about computers, are they gonna dedicate it to the rule for the sake of the rule, it, to justice is to use the authority you have, the skills you have, for the well being of those who need it, right? Injustice is to take the advantage you have as a parent, as a, as a professional, as a teacher, as a coach, you know, any of those positions of inequality. Injustice is to exploit the person who needs you and depends on you, right? So, same definition of justice completely different context, application. But that's what I think the, the artists are supposed to do. They're supposed to be able to identify the patterns and then to tell a story, write a dance or a song or a tragedy 
or uh, you know any kind of work of art where the the image what you see visually the the audience is familiar with right somebody in a computer um, in a room full of computers or some scene that's familiar and then the story is about how these patterns are playing out and if you are a computer person this is what's going to tempt you and look at the disaster and you know flush it out um motivate they want to motivate you to want to use your talents to help other people okay um so so given all of that um temperance is self-control in relation to eating drinking and sex and courage is the fear factor. But after that, once you build, I mean, that's the major project is to integrate the shadow, to balance animus and anima. Those are major foundational issues. But one of the reasons you wanna be motivated to do that in your personal life, in, in all other aspects of social life, in your, your function as a parent, how you teach your children, um, is because if you do behave yourself, you can reach higher and higher levels of culture and weave people together and have a strong social fabric. And if you don't, you're just constantly undermining your own society's ability to be a stable, cultured, to be, to be a society you, that you can be proud of, right? True patriotism, right? We really do have a lot of culture. I remember um, there were some students from Sri Lanka last year in my class, and they did talk about how the arts play a big part in their culture. Now, I know that they've had some issues with uh, Muslim and Buddhist issues. Um, so I, again, I don't, I don't know enough to favor one society over another, but just the idea that the founders are at some point, the people who were designing this culture or they tried to form it, they really knew the, the power of the arts. And so they were trying to use the arts people would get together to recite poetry or something. Um, and that's a thing to be really proud of, right? That's authentic patriotism, but it's also something you would share. It's nothing that is exclusive. So someone who thinks the arts contribute will also be completely open. Well, let's since we know that dance is such a civilizing influence, Let's go all over the world and check out all the dances, right? Or music or stories about love lives, you know, just anything. People who really understand the influence of the arts in culture are not, are going to be completely open-minded. They're not going to be um, orthodox, right? Judgmental. Um, so another important virtue is generosity. So that means you give time and money. Um, if you have money, it's money. But for college students especially, it would be time. And a lot of you do a lot of volunteer work. And that's just, it's part of realizing your humanity because in that work, you're just recognizing with your body and with your life, your air gun, your way of life, that we do depend on each other. So being generous isn't an add on, you know, it's actually what we need to do because we need each other. Um, but, you know, to choose to do it because you understand human nature and the human condition, that's the only real generosity is if you choose it. So, you know, it can't be forced, but, but if you, choose it, it just means you understand the truth about human life and how much we depend on each other. Okay, so magnanimity is, is people who are super rich, 
giving away. And so we have to do a shout out to the Gates Foundation. They gave AUW a big chunk of change. And then we have to give a shout out to the World Bank because they gave AUW, I think it's 35 million bucks. Um, so it's, it's and, and a lot of you know NGOs, you, you have all your own stories about magnanimity. I just, my job is just to say, oh, that fits a pattern, you know? And it's not true because Aristotle said it. Um, so last year when I was at AUW, about 10 days after class started, um, Mr. Fazel, I think that's his name, the founder of Brock, and I sent you an email because it came today about how one of the big successes of Bangladesh and Brock has been its support of women. So shout out to Bangladesh. And um, also, I think that's the founder of AUW was a, a really close friend of the founder of Brock. Um, actually, originally, um, he the founder of Brock was going to help, helped him get a grant by giving him a headquarters, giving him uh, an office space or whatever, so he could apply for some of these big grants. Um, anyway, so that's the idea of Bra uh, Bangladesh and Brock has a really enlightened views on magnanimity and long-term the way to create long-term flourishing is to provide women with opportunities. Because if you can educate women, they will have fewer children. Those children will be healthier. And, and you know, there's a statistical, a lot of statistics about that's a, that is a very good starting point. Now, all of you know that COVID has set women back and uh, Brock, they send me, you know, newsletters regularly because I, I do donate to them every month, but I, it's not very much. It's just sort of embarrassing um, how little um, college teachers are kind of, they can't give the way my brother, the lawyer, or, you know, business people, my sister, the banker, <laughs> uh, then there's me, but that's okay. We do what we can. Um, so then the next thing is even temperedness, uh, avoiding anger. And of course, you've read a lot about anger. This is why I don't drink alcohol, because of the harm that it does to other people. Most people can't handle alcohol. And so it's not for religious reasons. It's actually for reasons about my responsibility as a citizen to create a flourishing culture. Every once in a while, I mean, you know, I don't want to be, you know, prissy about it. Although, you know, Muslims don't drink at all, and I think it's great. Uh, but there is there are reasons other than religious reasons, and they're pretty obvious, right? The harm that alcohol can do after all these stories about men getting drunk and then getting really losing their tempers. Um, so uh, the other thing is that anger is often tied to fear, okay? And so that's what the therapists will say, that um, anger is a secondary emotion. But lots of times people aren't conscious that what's really driving them is fear. And so um, a lot of the anger in the US right now and the insurrection at the Capitol, that rage, underneath that is fear the people who are so angry don't really know how they're going to provide. They can't see a future for their children or grandchildren. They can't, you know, their standard of living has gone way down from their grandparents. And so fear drives a lot of it. But of course, you can't tell them that because it's completely buried because that's not masculine. You know, you just have to be tough and get mad. And then also you find somebody else to blame. <laughs> you blame other people, um, which is all very unhealthy. And the stories of the Greek poets tell 
always have pe have characters projecting their own stuff onto somebody else. Um, so rational ambition, um, and this was when we talked about the gods with the goddesses, it was just that women need to um, be able to be angry, if you remember with Artemis, to be able to know their capacities and achieve at their level. So patriarchy prevents them from having reasonable ambitions, right? And that's because they're, you know, if you're supposed to just get married and have a family, you're, you're not even supposed to know you, you have capability of anything outside of that. Uh, with men, it tends to be the other extreme. They tend to think that they're better than they really are, or they should go higher in the company. Well, that would be Apollo and Zeus, you know, the ones who want to be successful according to the male, uh, male creation of the definition of success. They will fight each other to get to the top, right? That's not rational ambition. That's pride. They're overestimating their, you know, where they should be on the hierarchy. Then the other side were the Dionysian and the Hades, the ones that don't even try. And they just step out, you know, Poseidon, Hades, uh, Dionysus, they're not ambitious enough. And, and if their parents keep trying to force them into the traditional success mode, then they step away, right? But if their parents let them be the filmmaker, the painter, the traveler, you know, then they can achieve. Other people recognize their talents. So that is the best way. Everybody seeks to develop their talents they figure out what those talents are. Some of them are just responses to, um, to obstacles that they've had or just a really serious introversion, but that's okay. As long as it comes out with something creative, something that other people, that inspires other people, that's what you really want. Um, rational pride, so women often are not honored enough and men tend to get honored more than they deserve. Um, so, you know, it must be pretty painful to the children of those Zeus and Apollo types if they have to keep going to these banquets where their father is honored. Oh, your father's so wonderful. And, you know, the kid goes, well, say hi to him for me, he's never home. <laughs> or, uh, you know, he, he, you know, I can't talk to him about myself or my life. I can't, you know, he's not there for us. He's not there emotionally. He's not there physically a lot of times. Uh, we have to fit into his mold. And so, you know, there is a, it's not fair. <laughs> uh, so the Zeus Apollo types tend to get honored too much. And then the other types of gods tend not to get honored enough. Um, let's see, I think it was the Hermes type that could that becomes a therapist or the Hades type. And you know, male therapists are not honored as much as like rich, powerful men. And that's that's not fair. It's really inappropriate. Uh, friendships are important, and they're important to every single uh, archetype. When people can't find a soulmate to talk to, because your mind is an inner dialogue of the soul with the self, right? You're self-correcting, but you really, really need at least a few friends who are like Aristotle says, another self, right? It's sort of like you're talking to yourself when you're talking to your friend and your friend reminds you, right, of, oh, yeah, that's right. So they just help you get an even higher level of that inner dialogue. The trouble is if you project and you mistake who, who your real friend would be because they'll plant a dialogue in your head that isn't the right one. And that does a lot of damage. So your relationships 
are really, really important. And then in Aristotle, there's two whole books out of 10 that talk about all the different kind of bonds that people have with each other. So if you remember when I talked about Delphi and Olympia, I talked about how they're designed, especially Olympia, to create all these bonds. So friendship is very generic. It means all the kinds of bonds that we have with each other. So athletes and athletes and coaches and coaches and judges and judges and, you know, managers and managers. And there's all this bonding that goes on. And then you're less likely to declare war on these people because you know them, <laughs> right? So, so all that stuff is really important. Uh, sociability, putting up with minor injustices, right? This is really hard to judge because if women or because people do this, they do it because they're blind. And how much do you need to keep reminding them of, I deserve more than this, or you shouldn't tell people in public that I'm fat or, you know, stuff like that. And um, so, you know, we all do this. We put up with stuff, but gosh, it can be pretty, it, it just, kills, it poisons the culture, it unravels the fabric. Truthfulness, you know, trying to really be honest, trying to get it right, trying not to hurt people, even in minor ways, is, is a goal, right? So then the next thing are the political virtues. So learning how to be a citizen. And I talked about that a lot with Delphi, right? and Olympia, right? People are coming together, creating a body of laws, learning how to govern themselves. If you remember at Delphi, the person coming for advice gets a riddle and they have to internalize it. So they have to govern themselves and a criminal comes and they have to determine their own punishment so that if they can judge even in their own case, then they can be a citizen because citizens have to people who are the intellectual ability or the moral and intellectual capacity is that you can see yourself as a citizen and see how you should treat people and how they should treat you in a way that will maximize the stability and the quality and the complexity of the political culture. So the art of legislation, knowing how to make good laws. I think all of you who do follow a number of your posts show that you're aware of the political leaders in your country. Not, I mean, not all of you, but some of you. And um, it's natural for us to think about these things and we should think about them. And we should also know that there's a lot to think about. You can't just have an opinion. Um, and you can't just disagree. There's just a lot of distinctions. You should educate yourself and each other about that. How to distribute uh, social goods, I would say, not just money, but educate, excuse me, education, status, um, a lot of stuff that societies can give you that, that um, you can't just give yourself, right? So how to distribute that, how to punish wrongdoing, how to apply the laws in a particular case. Um, and then ultimately in every situation, if you have phronesis and I with uh, Delphi, the end of that is life is one big riddle, right? We're always trying to solve the riddle, but every day you probably make 20 decisions, right? Where you deliberate either in your own mind or with somebody else. And it's just a puzzle. And you have to present yourself with what are all the options? Um, which is the best option? As far as I know, what are the options? Which is the best one? Why is it best? And then, you know, the next day or two, oh, I didn't realize that was an option. Okay, 
I've got to change my deliberation. So this is basically what we spend our lives doing. Um, it's just systematizes it. It makes you, just gives you a chance to step back and look at that. And all these are patterns and we're all stuck in the middle of them. And then we can, you know, then we know it's not that I've, I haven't been picked out for punishment or anything. Life just is complex. Um, so now I want to stop there and see if each of you can find some example, if you brought with you of a virtue or a vice, um, or if somehow while I'm talking, you might have thought of something. So I'm going to give everybody a chance to talk. And then we'll, I'll do the poetics about tragedy, then I'll give you another chance. And I'm sure we'll be done by then. Okay. All right, so Rupia, did you come up with something? Okay, so again, go in the chat if you're, uh, so if you're, um, you don't have something, you can chat me. Yeah, okay. The other thing is if you somehow the electricity, you can't, you can listen, but you can't communicate. Just, you know, all I'm asking is that you let me know when you're absent, why you're absent. So, for example, today, I will wait till tomorrow, maybe the next day, but I do have to report the week's attendance. And um, I don't mind at all. I just need to know. And I'll just say excused absence or whatever. So it's not a big deal. It's just a reporting in thing. Okay, Louis. Now, Louis, if you want to say something from last time, you can do that too, if you like. Yeah. Uh, hello, Professor. Hi. Um, can I can I talk about the virtual first? Sure. And then I will go if I have time. Yeah. Um, I will talk about a person in the public eyes. Uh, he's his name is Winji Hill. Um, he studied at Cambridge University. He was a top economic graduate and like was first ranked at Old Course. Um, after graduating, he has a job with a uh, high salary and promised to promotion and stuff like that. But like he quit the job and came back to Vietnam to file and lead around like 10 education, 10 education ventures. Um, the goal of the education ventures is to reimagine the education in Vietnam. Uh, they want to teach every, every kid to help them discover themselves, um, uh, help them develop based on their own talents, instead of like trying to shape them in the way that society thinks and society wants. Um, they, so they not only teach students, but they also train teachers around Vietnam, ranging from the city to remote areas. Uh, they also built many public schools for the dis um, disadvantaged kids in the remote areas. Uh, so I think like he has two virtuals. The first one is like giving a lot of money, time to remote the entire society well-being. And the second one is re rational ambition like develop one's natural ability, give them opportunity to develop the highest level in the way that's more meaningful to each person and also contribute to the society at whole. Yeah, this is my example. Okay, Louis, I'll tell you. So my Vietnamese students, what is it, May and Louis? Or is it Rossi? I can't remember. Mr. My professor. I'm hey, okay, so so May and Louis have been telling me about the standard education of Vietnam is very rote and all this stuff, and so it really is nice that it sounds like this guy really gets it and he knows that that's not the way to go in the future. Is that is that true, Louis? Uh, yeah. Okay, that's great. Exactly. Now, you guys, because you have liberal arts education, you might think that someday you might want to get connected with that. Um, 
but you know, each of you has your own thing. Um, it's just that coming to this liberal arts school and a woman's might, you know, the person, the people running that might at least want your insights or your input, even if it's not your career. But anyway, okay, Louis, what else did you want to say? I have an, another example about strategy, but I think it's, it's in the second round, right? Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Rossi, have you got something? Yes, sir, I do actually. Um, there's two people that I want to talk about. Um, first is Sai. Um, he led a campaign called Run With Sai. And just a background information, in Cambodia, there are two children, non-profitable children's hospital, Gunta Bopa and Anko Hospital for Children. And because of COVID-19, the two hospitals are on the verge of closing because there's not enough funds. And so what Sai does is he dedicates his time to run around Cambodia to raise money to donate for the hospital. So he runs for a total of 2,400 kilometers for nearly 99 days to donate or to raise money and donate to the hospital. And then he also motivates um, SMART, which is a very big network company in Cambodia to create smile concert alongside with playing artists and a lot of social media influencers to raise um, 100 more, 100,000 more dollars and SMART also donated $10,000 to the two hospitals. And what Sai is um, exerting is rational ambition to help the people and also his his generosity to dedicate his time because he's a singer and a model but he gave up like nearly a hundred days of his time to do such charity work and i think it's something that is needed in times like this and Good. similarly there's another guy i know um his name is chun pani he lives like next to my village he donated 300, oh, 3,000 meters squared of his land to a pagoda to build a school, a primary school so that um, children in the village is able to have like a new uh, facility with like full equipment. And that's just acts of kindness and generosity that I think is needed when there's like all this chaos happening. Very good. Okay, Nahida, do you have something? Uh, professor, I want to write it down in the chat box. I have network issues. What? I want to write it down in the chat box. I have network oh, okay. issues. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll move on. I'll when we get through all the, the verbal stuff, I'll go check the chat books because I'm not good at, at multitasking both of them, but I'll get to you. Okay, May. Uh, okay, Professor, like before, Louis said about one educator in Vietnam. And um, also, I, I also want to talk about another educator, like, but he is very young, like he is at my age, like 21 years old. So. And um, actually he was born in a very like, rich family um he, he was lucky to receive good education when he since he was more um and now he he's currently studying in malacaster college i guess in us um but he he is fully aware that because he is lucky so he want to bring like um education like liberal education and what he already experienced outside vietnam to my country so that more students uh, from different backgrounds can also experience like liberal educa liberal education and also um, they can flourish like better. So for me, he is like a real like inspiring friend. Um, he, he, he was also like working with um, the educator Louis said before, like he, 
and also in the past he did a lot of projects and all of his projects like focus on education and bring like education to more people in Vietnam because actually in my country not everyone can afford like education like abroad or like they can have like opportunities to go outside and many families also have like uh, many stereotypes about like education abroad and kind of stuff so they don't let, let their children do that so he tries to bring those um the education he experienced abroad to vietnam so that more people can get access to it and i really like that idea and i also look forward to like cooperating with him in the future as well because i also care about education and my my vision is somehow like in alive with his vision kind of like that is so he a friend a personal friend of yours yeah he um actually before we just know each other through like the internet because he really has the influence in my country and we kind of like added each other on facebook and some of the social media and gradually we talk a bit more and now we become friends okay may i'll tell you i when i move at the end of um may um i'm gonna live about two miles from McAllister college <laughs> So oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it would be great. I could have them over for dinner. So you just, you know, we got to keep following that up. That would be great. Um, okay. okay. Uh, Bondona, what have you got? Uh, mm, uh, Ma'am, uh, like, um, uh, I'll talk about an engineer. Like, he's not an not even an engineer, but he's also an uh, actor. Like uh, his name is uh, Sonu Sud. Like in the time of like uh, like this last, I I'll say last eight months. Uh, like when the pandemic crisis like uh, sort out. Like uh, in India, we have a lot of migrant people, so they used to go from uh, like a village to town areas to walk. So like many people have traveled to like uh, Mumbai and like many other city uh, like city for uh, to work and like at the time of crisis when suddenly lockdown was given uh, uh, what happened uh, like uh, the people uh, those who were the migrant they were very like afraid uh, means like uh, they were and they left they were left behind they have no money to come back home no transport to uh, like uh, where they can afford and they can come back home because at the time that was complete lockdown and so like the actor uh, after two weeks of uh, lockdown he uh, came out and helped all the migrant worker uh, to get back home here he have arranged like more than uh, uh, like he have sent more than one lakh people to their or original home he have arranged buses uh, train and even uh, aircraft uh, airplanes for like them to reach home safely and like uh, he uh, at a time of crisis like he was like a real hero because like uh, when all the all were lo uh, locked behind their homes he came out uh, and like supported everyone you know, so that they can go home and they can be safe uh, and like um, uh, Yes, now even he is supporting many like uh, people who wanted to study at the lockdown, lockdown village people do not have a smartphone. So like online classes were held and they were like uh, very down and like were looking for help. At the time they wrote letter to Sonusud and like he read them and he supported, uh, he funded from his own 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 finance and he have given many uh, of them books even smartphone uh, for their studies and like he took uh, charge of many uh, homeless children and like uh, he's uh, like he had played a great role and even now he is doing that work uh, so that he can help people so uh, i think he have yeah that's a great example very good uh if that's all yeah that's magnanimity that's it's all good bondona um poppy do you have something professor i will say later okay um dt
Okay, Jareen. Okay, um, Esbina. Okay, Fahima, are you there? Okay, I'll check. Oh, okay. So we're going to get some in the chat box here. So let me check out the chat box. Um, okay. Actually, <laughs> you don't have to. Don't chat me saying, please record, because I won't notice it. Just go ahead and yell at me. This is great. <laughs> Just get okay. my attention. Yeah. I I don't see any notes here. Um, I don't see anything in the chat box. So I'm going to let that. I'm going to keep my example here. OK. So one of my yoga teachers, uh, life history made me feel the tragedy of life. She seemed very uh, indifferent while she spent her time in home. She's very intelligent, extroverted, peace loving. I saw her supporting people mentally to overcome the barriers of life. She talks with people, think carefully about their sense of purpose. Many men wanted to marry her, being fascinated by her personality, but she's still unmarried. And uh, she uh, she's, uh, she has uh, founded a orphanage and raising child there. So one day I read her biography and I came to know that he grew up in his aunt's house without his parents. Her father denied her because she was a woman and her mother committed suicide after the event. Actually, uh, so from childhood, she decided to remain unmarried rather than being suppressed by patriarchy and devoted her life for human well-being. Okay. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, okay. Jerry, uh, anybody else? We can, let's move, we can move on to the next issue. Um, all right, so the next thing is tragedy. And this is um, how the poets, because they think there are these patterns, right? This is a long, I don't need to go through that. Um, let's see, here we go. I think this is the one I want. Yeah, okay. So when, um, so it's like like the woman, I read the article about the, the woman hacker who's doing it for good, right? So a poet could, could read the news someday or something like that and instantly they could see oh there's a pattern here and then they would write a story they would write a tragedy about it um in that case it's not tragic so that case just has a it's a general pattern but um something comes up in the news where somebody really had good intentions this is a tragedy. They had good intentions and they thought about stuff and they planned ahead and they were really, you know, thoughtful, but they still made a mistake and everybody got hurt. And so if something like that happens, that's something a poet would write about because the poet wants to make you um, heightened self-conscious awareness, right? just heightened awareness of these different blindnesses that you have. And when you go to the performances or you listen to them reciting Homer, it'll, it registers and you go, oh my gosh, like that's me or that's my parents or that's my friend or that's, you know, like you do in class. Um, so that's, so this is the, the patterns in each work of art, right? First of all, they're mythoi, they're patterns, they're not facts, because you know what happens if you start discussing a certain specific person and you say, I think that person 
is um, made a mistake for this reason and somebody else will defend them. And it was just, you know, so you just tell a story about a character that in Homer, it, it happened historically so long ago, or it happened historically, but it's, but you're, you're making it into art. It's possible. You usually pick historical figures to communicate that this really can happen. You know, this isn't unicorns. <laughs> this is people. And, but then you do it, you turn it into art. Um, it's more educational because it's a pattern. Um, Plato writes patterns. Plato's dialogues are patterns. Um, the plot is the most important. And so he says, everybody has good opinions. And that's true. <laughs> we all have great opinions about this person should do this or that, or, um, uh, you know, we always can talk about virtue, whether your teacher is a fair grader or something like that. Uh, but it's in the choices that we make in the critical moments of our lives that determine whether we flourish or not and whether the people around us do. So we shouldn't think that we're good people just because we have opinions or we think we're good. Um, in the US, this is a terrible problem and it might be a problem in Muslim countries also. People go to church and they say, you know, I love Jesus. And um, everything I do, I think, I, I truly believe that Trump represents God's plan on earth. And I really do believe that my preacher affirms that and I can quote from the Bible. And um, in the US, people just think if they have good intentions, they don't have to think about it any further than that. They don't have to notice what he's actually doing. And that's, that's not tragedy because they're not trying to really think it through. But, you know, it's coming to a bad end. It's not tragic because they're not serious people. They don't really want to question their religion or their preacher or their good intentions. People who really learn from tragedy know that they have good intentions, but they're willing to question their good intentions, right? You know, I mean, I've had things happen to me where if there's one thing that I thought I knew about my life, it was that. And then it was, <laughs> no, you didn't know that. And so I've kind of learned my lesson that I don't think there's anything about my life that I can think I actually know. <laughs> And so, but that leaves you open, you know, if somebody wants to tell me if, you know, uh-uh, then I can go, oh, well, okay, right? Um, so, so we have to worry about our good intentions. We have to worry about our blindnesses. We have to worry about our excesses. Um, they're all characters are types. Uh, they're usually named after somebody. So a certain type of person gets in a certain type of situation and overreacts in this certain type of way. Now, the dialogues have characters that are better than most people. Plato has Socrates. Uh, Homer has Odysseus and um, uh, Hector. But each of them is flawed also. So all of Homer's characters are flawed in some way. But some are better than most people. Some are worse than most people. Then there's the ones in the middle, which is all of us. Um, at least I am. Um, and those are the people who make a mistake. They, they are serious people, but they make a mistake in judgment and it leads to great suffering. They go from happiness to misery, um, from prosperity to defeat. Um, and so the, the poet is trying to get you to wake up so that you don't make that kind of mistake, so that your society doesn't suffer from your own blindnesses. 
Um, they're related to each other, uh, family, because as it is pretty obvious, um, people tend to depend on each other most within a family, and they also can wound each other the most because love is a need. We need each other the most, but then we also need each other to be good citizens. And we wound each other when we don't behave ourselves as citizens. It's just, that's not as obvious, but it's there definitely. It all plays a role in the ability for our society to actually develop, you know, and flourish. Um, okay, the, the audience members wa watch this reversal in Fortune and they um, identify with the character and then they um, are afraid, right? Oh my gosh, I could do this or somebody I know. So there's this catharsis of uh, pathos. When you feel like the world is coming at you, that's when you're pathetic. You're in this passive state. Like, I can't do anything. Okay, why me? Um, and then your tendency is to just <laughs> overreact, right? And so that's what the stories tell of somebody who feels like they're, you know, they're in stuck and they just lash out. And so, um, so you are afraid that, geez, I could do that. I understand that. And so you plant this, this uh, neuron, you know, in the, in the electric shock in the back of your mind, so that if you run into this situation, your mind's going to go, oh, that's right. <laughs> Hecuba, I remember that. Oh, I don't want to do that. And so that's what, you know, it's trying to educate you in that way that you've got these patterns in the back of your head. Also, you can help other people you say, I think you have an Oedipus complex. You really need to get over it. This is why I think so. Um, let's see. So Everybody is supposed to come together, watch the tragedies, go down to the taverna, talk about them, talk to each other. Somebody says, oh, I love Agamemnon. And I just go, what? <laughs> like, he's a dictator and he's so ignorant. And he's so, how could you like him? Um, but anyway, so that's how tragedy works. Um, so the next round is, could you think of examples of tragic situations. So Rupia, are you there? Have you got anything, Rupia? Okay. Uh, Louis, do you have something? Um, yeah, I have an example, but I have to, sorry, because like, I talk a lot about the dark side of education in Vietnam, but it's true. Yeah, like I want to talk about my high school principal. Um, I have to say that my three years high school is three years that I saw most people from a teacher like to student all suffering in some way. Like <clears throat> my principal, she was obsessed with status and money. So she will like, um, try to do everything to gain a good reputation to push like the rank of my school to higher position. So like I said before, in the weekly post, like in every competition, we know the question before the official days. And if not, she will try to bribe the trust to have the student wins in the competition. So, uh, there was a teacher, she's my dorm teacher of my class, told me that she had to pretend that this dark side don't exist to, to do what like they want her to do to keep her job. She feel like guilty when, the, when she witnessed the children were obsessed with scoring with rankings and they just try to compete each other. Uh, not only student but teacher also like for example in the biology faculty uh, the teacher also compete each other to become a head of the department 
So she she told me that she's scared to go to school every day because it's absolutely not an education. It's something like go again her conscience. I I am the one feel the same with her. I feel that there is there was only two type of person in my school. Ones who is trapped by standard fame, glories, and they just blindly go and don't know what they want. And sec- the second type we are the ones who like the teacher and my teacher and me, like who were left behind, feel helpless and lose faith in people and society. So like recently, I have heard that she quit the job. She moved to another school. So I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my example. Yeah, well, that's really good. I mean, and that is in our society, we think greed is good. And so literally people believe that if they pit employees against each other, right, to compete, that that's going to make for a better society because it will increase the overall income, right, the gross domestic product or something. That is really so bad, you know, that it's just the belief that that would be a positive thing is is so barbaric. And it, it like history shows you that that's not true, right? It's just ignorant. Um, anyway, good example, Louis. Okay, Rossi, do you have something? Okay, uh, Nahida, do you have something? Okay, May. Um, I should profess. Okay, who? Rossi, are you there? Okay. May, why doesn't May go? And I'll come back to those people I skipped over if if you're ready. Okay, May, where are you? There you are. Yeah, um, I think I will like uh, give the example of the tragedy of my family, I guess. Like, actually I also told it in my previous essay, like when I was in my grade nine, like my, fa- my father passed away and it's like um, a huge loss for the whole family because my father is like uh, was like the one who take care of financial stuff for the whole family and her, also for like teaching the children because in my family like my mother um, was just the housewife so when when my father passed away like she didn't really know how to deal with teaching like me and my elder brother and kind of stuff and my um my elder brother like he, he he is like 12 years older than me um at that time he was um, working in hanoi like the capital of vietnam but due to that loss he needed to come back home like very quickly and then he like and my my mother was kind of like um the middle type like he she realized a lot on like uh, children and also she is overprotective and at that time she was like lost. She was like very like nervous, like how to deal with all of stuff after that loss, uh, because it is very sudden. And uh, at that time, my 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 brother like he he chose to sacrifice so that I could like do whatever I want, like because uh, my mother really needed one child to stay here with her. He she couldn't live alone and like deal with all stuff. So because at that time I was very small and I was like, I was really um, like there, there, there is a future ahead, like awaiting me. So my my father, I'm um, sorry, my elder brother decided to go back home, like stay here with my mother and also like found a job in my um, area, my hometown, even when it was, it is just a small hometown and there, there were not like many jobs available for him. But because he thought of me, he, he knew that if like I would I if I needed to stay here, like I couldn't have a good future. So he he decided to sacrifice for me. So I think it's also one of the things I feel most grateful for. Like there was someone there like willing to sacrifice for my future, and that's why it's also 
also one of my motivation like to really, really try because he already sacrificed like um, his like bright career ahead in a big city to come back here in a small hometown just for me. So I think I have the responsibility and also have the motivation to really try to be my best self. Yes, yeah, so that's my example. <laughs> okay, that's good. That's I, I know that a lot of people helped me and a lot of people paid for my education. And so I want to give back to whatever way I can. It's all, you know, everything's connected. So Bondona, do you have something? Ma'am, I have a lot of things. Uh, yeah. Uh, in terms of competing, like in the election held in our country, like uh, the opposition party, like the party, two or three parties, they used to compete uh, between each other. Like uh, they used to form a society, uh, the community or the uh, state or the uh, the majority party, like they they will promise that like before the election, I mean, uh, they will say uh, we will provide you this, we will provide you this and that, 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 and then all sort of stuff they will say, and like and the opposition party will say, uh, means if they say this, the opposition party will say, like means uh, one term means like higher than that. We will provide you this and that. Like uh, they will compete between each other and like. Like, and like finally what happened after uh, they get uh, when the election are held and finally the results are out and they mean I mean to say that uh, they forget all the stuff they whatever they said or whatever uh, they told that they will give okay do uh, like 50 percent of the work they do and the 50 percent are left behind the uh, promise or the uh, the words they get, have given to the people, they are all always left behind. And the community runs uh, uh, like that. And like, um, yes, uh, competition happens between the election parties, but like, um, but like the ultimate result does not come out. What uh, they promise to give the people or like the society doesn't come out. And one of the examples, like, uh, drawbacks we have in like in our school life childhood um, uh, like we were very like uh, uh, very like uh, we have very dominating natures like we used to compete between like uh, our like pre-mates classmates that uh, uh, we uh, will study and like we'll see who will get first, who will get second. Ultimately, it happens that uh, in terms of like winning, we just memorize the thing. Uh, we don't even learn what is uh, there in what is what is mean by that or what is mean by uh, this means what happened. Uh, like uh, actually, uh, like we we were just memorizing thing. I just remember we were just memorizing things. We were not learning. Ultimately, when uh, we came for the final exams in class ten, then we realized that we were just competing. We do not we have, didn't learn anything like uh, what shall we learn? So like yes, uh, competing nature is like uh, always uh, means like provide like uh, backward results. Means I have all uh, as term, uh, means as far as I have learned, uh, whenever I used to complete compete with another person, I have always lost something, and that's the ultimate thing. Very good. That's great. Um, and then you could you know you could write a story about stuff like that, right? So in elections, for example, the tragic character is the truly naive citizen of India that really does believe the politicians, right? And then, yes. then they, so politicians will appeal. I mean, they're in it for the vote, right? They're cynical. So they pick exactly the person and they can make themselves look like they're really religious and this person really believes it, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and then they get cheated, but they don't even know they get cheated. And so, so that's the kind of thing. If there were tragic uh, performances in each city state, right? Everybody in the whole society watches the stuff go on in the characters, then they would notice, right? Oh my God, my, you know, just like that, 
God, I'm not going to believe him that he actually is closer to God, right? Does that make yes, sense? Yeah, yes, okay. So that kind of level of critical thinking is necessary if you want a democracy, if you want to avoid a powerful leader, right? Like India has right now, right? Um, if you want to avoid letting yourself get manipulated, by fear or this pseudo religious, you know, the appearance of virtue and all that. So that that's really good. And Bondona, I'm glad, you know, that you learned that thing about school and memorizing. Um, yes, ma'am. But that's also why, you know, boys in those archetypes, right? They look at their big brother Apollo achieving and they go, that's just memory. Why should I do that? So it's not just that he's being rebellious because he just doesn't want to do anything. It's that the system is corrupt. And so the the Hades kid, the Poseidon kid, the Dion might actually be correct that that isn't worth pursuing, right? But the trouble is when that's corrupt, then they, they don't get around to asking, well, what is worth pursuing, right? That's the next step. And if they have a good teacher, good parents, a number of them go into architecture, right? And a lot of you had examples of these, I think it were three different types that tended to go into architecture, which is amazing because I had never noticed anything like that before. Um, but, you know, I, uh, right. I always learn a lot <laughs> when I, every time I teach the class. So. So that's good, Bondona. Could you see the connection there, even in between all those different, even the male archetypes? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, okay, good, Bondona, very good. Okay, Poppy, did you have something? Okay, I'm just gonna move quickly because we don't have much time left, but I've got your names down if you wanna talk next time. Um, DT, do you have something? Jereen? Professor. Do you have something? Professor. Okay. Fahima, do you have something? Okay, Rossi. Hi, Professor. Do you have something? Um, I yeah, I do. I'm sorry, my internet was cut off when you called me. It's okay. Um, I have a tragic story of Lika. She's a really famous dancer in Cambodia. She's a dance member of the OMG dance crew, and Lika has been involved in a lot of charity work, advertisement, collaborations. But just recently, she got into a tragic accident that kind of took away her future. She was in a motor accident and the accident caused her, caused an injury on her spinal cord. So she was hospitalized for three weeks. And during that three weeks, she underwent a lot of surgeries. And the doctor said that there's a very small percent chance that she is able to walk again because um, the spinal cord makes like the bottom half of her body numb. And so basically she's bedridden for months, but kind of from that tragic story, a miracle that happened. And recently she was able to walk again and have movements, but she, her career as a dancer was totally off the hook. She could no longer dance, but she, through all of this tragedy she was grateful that she her life was at least like 50 percent back to normal she's able to walk again okay um so um so technically we call those tragedies but they're accidents right i think that it it is important to distinguish those two um and it's also important to know, you know, have a good attitude. And I mean, there's all there's lots of life lessons there. The trouble is tragedy is when people think they're doing something good and they're not. That's technically speaking. 
because a poet can't write a story about an accident. They can write a story about how someone deals with an accident, right? Um, but we can't learn, I mean, other than just accidents happen. But anyway, but that's fine, Rossi. I don't want to get into it too much. I guess in my country, I like to point it out because uh, Americans just sit there and vote for Trump and it doesn't occur to them just because they have good intentions. You know, it's, we just don't admit that we have blindnesses. We don't, I mean, it's kind of scary, but anyway. Okay, so DT has, I wanna share a story about a guy who's an innovator, teaches young children who cannot uh, afford the money to get an education. In our village, many people uh, who have not enough ability for education because of their finances. Uh, school is far from our village where children can't go for those children. Okay, so somebody is magnanimous, right? They give um, a lot of money or a lot, they give their talents to help uh, poorer children. Uh, this one is Aspina, um, Sunita, a social worker, she works for women's empowerment. She saved many women from violence trafficking, becoming sex slave, suffered from sexual violence when she was a child. Um, so she decided not to let this happen. So a lot of you had stories about that when we covered Persephone. Um, okay, she even has given interviews, international news. Um, she gets donations. So. Um, again, the key there is that that is more like magnanimity. That's a virtue, right? That's where people are actually being virtuous. And also, uh, sometimes it, it comes from being crippled or frustrated. And that's true and that's good. The, the specific thing about tragedy is somebody that made a mistake in judgment. They think they're doing the right thing. Um, so think about all the religious people who are religious and they really think in the name of God, they're doing the right thing and they're not. <laughs> okay. That, that's a big deal where I live. Um, but there's a, other things like parents who think that if they push their kids into a well-paying career, that they really, that's really their parental responsibility. So it's one thing to have a big ego and you're, you know, it's really your kid is your ego. But what if you really, really believe that, you know, that you just don't want your kid to be poor because maybe you were poor. And so you really, it's heartbreaking for you to have to tell your kid you can't become an artist or dancer but you just really feel like you owe it to them. You know, that would be tragedy where, uh, you know, you're conflicted, you're worried, but, you're, but you do think you're making the right choice and you're not. Uh, but anyway, so that's the kind of thing that, well, how about marriage? Most, I mean, in the US, since people marry by choice, at least one of the partners, every, you know, every time there's a divorce, at least one of the people is probably tragic because at least one of them went into it with good intentions, right? And then they find out, oh my gosh, something went wrong. <laughs> so that's a case of uh, tragedy. Um, people sometimes, honestly, the way they treat their parents is something that they really think is the best and res most respectful, and it's really not. Um, well, okay, so a husband who thinks that he should manage the family and run the, you know, the finances, and he doesn't give his his uh, wife the skills. I mean, and then he dies, right? And so that was, you know, a tragic good intention. It would be better. My mother, if my father had died when we were young, my mother, he didn't give her any of the skills. <laughs> and, and our relatives, my grandma and grandpa, they were out to lunch. So I don't know what would have happened. 
um, church people, maybe, I don't know, but my dad just did not teach any of us about money because his family fought about money. He didn't want to talk about money, but that wasn't very smart, you know? None of us had very good money sense. Um, so it's just stuff like that that happens a lot. A lot of mistakes and judgment that go on and the poets just tell stories, try to educate you. So that's it. Uh, it's time for you to go. And I will see, I will see the AUW students. I will post, you know, the research papers and we'll talk about them next time. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Bye. Professor. Of course. Take care. Oh, I should stop.